Okay, I think we're about ready to go ahead and get started. I realize it's uh, hard to come in out of that beautiful sunshine and uh, come back into this <clears throat> conference room, but we're ready for the uh, third day of the ESIG workshop. And this morning, uh, we're going to start off with sex <clears throat> session six on price-based demand flexibility. We figured it was a little early in the morning. We didn't want you to have to make uh, you know, a lot of decisions about which session to go to. So we'll save that for after the break. So we will be pulling the wall again at the break, separating into two rooms and going into a Kiva A and Kiva B. But right now it's all, all one room. Welcome back everyone to the uh, price-based demand flexibility session. It'll be chaired by Lisa Schwartz, a senior policy researcher and strategic advisor at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, Lisa's been working closely with us, actually. She told me now she used to come to ESIG meetings when they were UVIG meetings. That was back a while ago, and we're glad to have her back again for ESIG meetings. So Lisa, welcome and thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Good morning, everyone. Um, we will be joined by everyone else from the sunshine at some point. I don't blame them for hanging out. And thanks so much for coming in. Uh, again, I'm Lisa Schwartz with Berkeley Lab. I'm happy to be here today. We have a really great panel on price based demand response. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna briefly introduce our presenters. JP Carballo is a research scientist in the Energy Policy and Markets Department at Berkeley Lab. We have Rob Kassman, who is a principal product manager of dynamic rates at Pacific Gas and Electric Company in California. Mitch Sears is executive officer of Valley Clean Energy, a community-based public energy planning agency, and it serves 125,000 customers in California. And last but not least, Jason Salmi Klotz is Senior Manager of Strategy and Planning at Portland General Electric. So I just wanted to uh, provide some context on how important price-based demand response is. Uh, more than 20 years ago, when I was at the Oregon Public Utility Commission, it was just a couple of years after the Western electricity crisis, where we had vast power shortages and extreme high prices. And uh, so two years after that, the Oregon Commission asked me to draft a report on the status of demand response programs in Oregon, which had been all but abandoned um, just two years later. Uh, and so my, um, my first recommendation uh, in the report that I wrote was that the utilities integrated resource plans should evaluate demand response on a par with other options for meeting both energy and capacity needs and our first presentation today by JP Carballo, Berkeley Lab is gonna tell you, we have not made that much progress nationwide over the last 20 years, but he has ideas on how to improve that. So thanks JP. All right, thanks Lisa. Thanks everyone for being here, good morning. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to present this, uh, this paper that uh, Lisa and I authored um, about a year ago, and we've been, been lucky to present it in several forums, so I'm excited to be here uh, in front of this particular audience and present this, this work. Um, the agenda for this presentation uh, involves uh, first a quick pass on why we're doing this, what is the motivation, and what is our approach. And then there's two big sections to the, to the technical brief that you could, uh, if you were to read it, one is largely focused on IRP, integrated resource planning, and uh, our findings of how price-based demand response is treated and what are recommendations to Im for improvement of this treatment. And um, then another section uh, on the more emergent use of price-based demand response and distribution system planning, which has, um, which is, as I mentioned, more, more novel. And at least did a great job in um, identifying the, the six, seven states that are implementing uh, distribution system planning that are including some aspect of rates or price-based amount response as a resource. I encourage you to read a technical brief today. I'm gonna to cover just very few aspects given time constraints. So the approach for integrated resource planning is to follow um, largely the structure of analysis that you find in the typical uh, demand potential or conservation potential studies or demand response studies uh, that accompany integrated resource plans. This is almost the majority or, or the, the majority of the uh, utilities and low serving entities that we survey or interview or, or whose plans we survey for this work uh, develop this structure that you see there. They identify the types of demand response resources other types of rates that we're gonna analyze. They calculate or de de determine the expected participation rate and the expected load reduction. 
And then they estimate what they call a technical and then an achievable potential. And with this information, plus the cost of running these programs, there is a certain, a certain selection of um, programs that are gonna be included as part of a, as a resource in terms of IRP. In the case of distribution system planning, as I mentioned, there was a review of the, these more nascent utility practices in six specific states. And we're gonna present sort of a general overview of those results towards the end of this uh, presentation. Yes, sure. Um, what are time buying rates? I mean, what we call price-based demand response is really enabled by rates that customers have are made available to customers by the utility or the retailer to serving them. There's typically five large five types of rates that we identify. Uh, a time of use rate, uh, which is probably you're all familiar with. Uh, the real time pricing, which is the other opposite of complexity, where time of use is the simplest way to represent some aspect of temporal variation in, in prices uh, or costs for operating the system. Real time pricing has a more granular representation and that's generally not super available. And if any, is available to some commercial and industrial customers only with some rare exceptions in residential pilots. And then we have more event-based types rates that are the variable peak pricing, critical peak pricing and critical peak rebates, all of which are geared towards nudging customers to take certain actions on certain times of the day, uh, sometimes by season when the system is more stressed and needs more help. So I'm gonna jump quickly into um, our findings and recommendations for the integrated resource planning aspects of price-based demand response. And for the purposes of this particular presentation, I'll focus mostly on two, um, two components of the overall set of variables that go into determining the technical and achievable potential and then uh, the selection of model portfolio. Um, I'm gonna talk about the participation rate uh, assumptions that go into determining um, how many customers can be enrolled or could participate, and then the expected low reductions. So in, in the terms of the expected participation rate, we find that about two thirds of the utility are clearly reporting participation rates by type and customer segments. The customer segmenting is relatively coarse. It remains residential, commercial, and industrial. Whereas in reality, we do know that there are many types of residential customers and there are many types of commercial industrial customers whose own characteristics may affect the type of responsiveness that they would have to different types of rates. But so far, utilities remain clustering customers in these very broad groups. One thing that we found is that there was an important distinction between an opt-in and opt-out. And only one utility in our sample of 12 um, didn't make that distinction. And only uh, another one did say explicitly that they were considering or assuming an opt-in situation. And the utility that reported both, you can see how impressive, the impressive difference between an assumption of an opt-in and an opt-out is really a 4X difference or a 5X difference in, in both. Unfortunately, none of the other utilities say anything about whether they're assuming opt-in or opt-out, or even if their regulator has already sanctioned that the um, customers have to be opt-in or opt-out into, into these rates. But you know, reporting that will be very important to understand whether the values that are being offered are reasonable or not. Uh, only one utility considered a low and a high um, value for the expected participation rate. And participation rate is really a behavioral component. I mean, the utility does a lot of effort in recruiting customers, but how many customers really end up subscribing and how easy or not they drop out over time. Those are all uncertain variables. And um, that's, that is very amenable to the scenario-based analysis that characterizes IRP. Nonetheless, in these types of uh, demand potential or conservation potential studies, we see very little use of that. Um, in general, we could not tell from most of the utilities where this data was coming from. Uh, as much as we search, there's really little to no support for all these numbers that you see here. Um, in general, the uh, consultant that's developing the study argues that based on their experience, this is an appropriate number. And that's all what we get. There is no indication, perhaps in one case, there was a consultant that was referring to a specific pilot that the utility had run where they had made an effort and they had determined a certain percent was a reasonable value to put as part of the assumption. But for the most part, we did not find any evidence uh, of where these values were coming from. On the side of the low reduction, so once we have the number of customers that we think are gonna be enrolled, the other important part of this is how many customers, how much do we think those customers are going to reduce their load uh, based on the types of rates that they're going to be exposed to. And so those two are the critical elements in determining how much actual 
megawatts of production I'm going to be able to achieve with these programs. As with the expected participation rate, we have a wide range of values um, ranging from very low um, values in the one to 2% all the way up to 40%. And we find some clear reasons why this was happened. For example, in the cases of the opt-in and opt-out here operate differently. The customers that are, are um, opted in tend to have higher um, higher reduction rates because they tend to be, you know, they're self-selecting into the uh, program. So they have an inherent incentive to participate in the program. And that generally means that they have an inherent incentive to be more responsive and to be more involved. And so, and that utility that made the opt-in of that distinction captures well the differences in values between the, um, the low reductions that are expected. Most uh, entities do distinguish summer and winter. Some of these are do not show up here for simplicity, but we found um, some of them make a call early on and say, we're gonna focus on summer because that's where our peak happens. But most of them or a few of them uh, do include differences between summer and winter, which is important because these programs will operate differently depending on what season they are, um, they're operating and what kinds of end uses are being affected by these price-based demand response programs. Um, one thing that remains unclear in our analysis is how these low reductions contribute to the peak demand or resource adequacy. So there's a, there's a big gap in these studies in terms of determining that you can get a 12% reduction of load and what that translates to in terms of contributions to resource adequacy in the you know, load and, and resources table at the very end of the IRP. And it is, we couldn't find a, a good, a transparent treatment of the low reduction assumptions to all the way to achievable technical potential and into how much megawatts um, are actually showing up as part of resources recognized on IRP. And that unfortunately uh, remains true for a number of the other variables. Uh, I will also highlight the, this third utility here, uh, data distinction between um, the regular control and no deregular control, finding that the customers that were uh, deploying these price-based demand response and also had some sort of enabling technology achieved three times more reduction. And in other case, uh, some more marginal um, for the critical peak pricing, but it could achieve large, larger reductions with enabling technologies. So finally, one thing that we did is as we were, we had all this information about low reduction potential coming from the achievable potential, and we had the cost of our programs, we tried to calculate a hopefully standardized levelized cost of capacity to try to compare the cost of these price-based demand response programs against other types of resources that also can um, uh, contribute with capacity, for example, a, a natural gas peaker. And, and so for these, we, um, the numbers that you see here compare very favorably with the 90 to $120 per kilowatt year that typically is the cost of new entry in most ISOs or TOs, which is a, a, a relatively comparable value. And the capacity costs that we find are substantially lower, are eight to 10 times lower, which is not surprising. I think it's been more or less established that these resources are relatively cheap uh, and, and affordable, but it's, uh, it's interesting to have also an understanding of how these values differ across types of rates and across utilities. Uh, for example, in only the time of use rate, you can see that one utility is assuming 80 to 100 kilowatt years uh, of uh, 80 to 100 dollars of kilowatt year cost, whereas a utility is in the in the lower rows in that table assume or find that they are uh, six to eight times lower in their case. So let's move now to what are kind of the shortcomings that we're um, seeing after analyzing these 12 IRPs uh, and the way they treat price based demand response. Um, in general, the way price based demand response makes its way from these demand potential studies to the IRP itself is, is very hard to track. Um, the demand potential studies are 80 to 120 page long documents that should fit clearly into some part of the IRP where you're you know, examining resources and building preferred portfolios. It's very unclear to understand how that line that says demand response in the, in the IRP, where that line comes from, most of the time, the number that is reported in the table does not correlate at all with what you see in the demand uh, conservation potential or study, uh, which means that there is some sort of derating happening that the reader is, is not um, unfortunately um, available to. Some shortcomings, as I mentioned, involve the lack of transparency 
uh, in the type of price based demand response modeled, many most of the time we don't really know what exact rate and the form of the rate that's being modeled. It says time of use. So unfortunately, the reader has to go to the uh, web page of the utility and see what is the available time of use rate to at least have an, have an idea what exact shape that um, resource takes. And um, most of the time, some of the, some, of the, some of the time, these rates do vary over time. So you no, don't know if you're seeing the rate that was really applicable and available at the time of that particular demand response study. Um, the, we find that the rationale for the level of the price-based demand response is adopted, as I mentioned, is, is always is unclear. So we, we can't really trace from the input data all the way to the output. Um, there's generally a treatment of price based demand response as a low reduction, and we have been over several years in our group um, uh, uh, proposing and suggesting that price based demand response and in general distributed resources should be treated as resources in IRP. And I'll talk about what that implies in a little bit. Um, this also entails that there is a lack of use of supply curves, and so su supply curves is the practical way in which you incorporate any distributed resource into IRP. And one of the main there's, there's two main features that it achieves. One is that it allows to recognize the different types of demand response or, in general, distributed resources uh, available under costs in, in a supply curve. So you can choose. Um, among, a, among a portfolio of resources up to the point where the marginal cost of that resource matches the marginal cost of the, of, in, of the study. But also this is a practical way, a supply curve is a practical way to embed uh, distributed resources into a capacity expansion model such that the model itself is the one that can choose what is the optimal level where you should cross that curve and not an exogenous assessment of what that value should be. So um, going into specific recommendations, one thing that we found in, in at least two or three of the plans that we analyzed is that the demand response, privacy demand response, was immediately screened out at the very beginning of the analysis because they, it was deemed unpredictable. Um, it's true that the behavioral elements behind price-based demand response makes it a resource that you can't just flip a switch and assume that it's there, but um, we were suggesting that this would just be a rigorous analysis to actually determine what is the resource adequacy? What is the, the, the actual availability of the resources for several scenarios? Uh, in particular, we do know that for certain types of critical events, the amount of someone is actually quite available. And that's, that's not showing up anywhere in this analysis. Um, we also are proposing that uh, enabling technologies should be incorporated. As you saw, one utility was making a difference between um, low reduction rates with and without uh, the rate load control. And the fact, the, the problem is that if you were to think about enabling technologies as an additional resource, you, can, you should include those costs in the, in, the, in the plan and say the cost of this resource with this enabling technology is this, but since I achieved this amount of reduction, the actual levelized cost of capacity is actually quite competitive. Uh, those types of analysis have not performed at all. It, this would even go to the point where uh, utilities that don't have AMI, that don't have smart meters, generally screen out and say, we can't do any type of price-based amount response, we don't have the meters. Well, maybe you can, and, and, and among other things, assess the cost of those meters and compare whether just maybe the price responsiveness component that is enabled by those meters could warrant their deployment, at least in some segments of customers. But that's, again, not available. Um, as I mentioned in participation and low reduction rates, I think I covered um, a fair amount of these already. I'm going to uh, maybe emphasize in the low reduction rates to make sure that the low reduction rates are consistent with the capacity accreditation process that is used in the IRP. In particular, it will be ideal that um, the low serving entities that are running IRPs calculate an ELCC for their price-based demand response and in general for their distributed resources, just as they do with the supply side resources. Um, so everything is done in a certain comparative level. Now, of course, this implies a whole lot of more study, but it is, we believe the right way, especially as distributed resources will become larger and larger and they will be incorporated or trying to be incorporated as virtual power plants, developing these methods to calculate proper ELCCs contributions for distributed resources is going to have a wide range of applications. I'm going to spend now move into the distribution system planning component of our work and I'm going to briefly cover a couple aspects. So in distribution system planning is quite different than IRP. Perhaps one of the key differences is that distribution system planning tends to be a much more least cost and cost benefit analysis mix uh, analysis where um, whereas IRP is almost entirely a least cost exercise. But that, that is the fact that you have cost based uh, that you have a cost benefit analysis involved 
enables a number of interesting uh, uses of price based demand response when they benefit certain types of customers or certain types of um, services in the system. So the typical way in which utilities are considering price based demand response is through geographically targeted forecasting, um, pricing and program pilots, and eventually ending up in a wireless alternative procurement within their, their uh, distribution system plants. Uh, the typical needs that demand the price based demand response uh, are, can achieve, and these are noted in the different plants, include the deferral value coming from load relief. So essentially uh, deferring distribution system investments for a few years. And there's a, of course, a financial benefit there. Uh, voltage regulation, which is an ancillary service, resilience benefit, and the electrification are great cost containment. So this is essentially also deferral value uh, but more focused on specific electrifications. What's interesting here is that these types of needs that are identified and used quite actively in these few um, distribution system plans that we study, they, they seldom show up at all in IRP. Uh, if anything, the, there is an implicit capacity deferral value, which is the resource policy contribution, but there's no recognition of these added benefits that price based demand response may have also at the bulk part system level, whereas in the distribution system, they are recognized. Some recommendations that uh, we came up for consideration of price based demand response in distribution system planning or to, for enhancing their consideration um, <clears throat> is to uh, evaluate price based demand response specifically to defer distribution system investments and mean new loads. And this is essentially matching directly the use of price based demand response as a tool for especially emerging electrification challenges. Uh, this is already happening in a few states, but it's not prevalent. Um, adding a dynamic rate to help address local distribution uh, uh, events. So being more proactive in developing types of rates that are, can be targeted to certain parts of the system and avoid specific, uh, specific needs. You know, the distribution systems are vast and very heterogeneous. And so that enables or should suggest the ability of utilities to deploy types of rates that are more targeted. Uh, we're also advocating for improved grid data and advanced planning tools. These two go together. This is essentially a way of making more, the, the whole process more transparent, but also enabling third parties to design and propose types of you know, wireless alternatives. Uh, and this is something that may, may have a, an important impact as there are more and more distributed resources, in particular batteries being deployed, that can be operated quite effectively as non-wireless alternatives. Uh, there are already utilities that are deploying and owning their own in front of the media batteries, but there is strong potential for types of rates that nudge customers that own batteries to also operate them and provide them wireless alternative benefits to the distribution system. And then finally, we're, we're also proposing to conduct systematic studies of the locational value of demand response. And again, seeing the distribution system in a, in a much more granular way and determining what types of needs within that system match the specific benefits that price based demand response can provide. So again, a lot of these recommendations do impose some level of you know, larger, more sophisticated analysis, but we believe that, as I mentioned earlier, this is very important as we progress towards virtual power plants and much more actively involvement of, in general, distributed resources, in particular, price based demand response as studied here. So with that, I'll, I'll have our, um, your contacts there. Great. <laughs> Excellent timing. Great. How about that, Lisa? I always double up and oh. have two timers, uh, yeah. two alarms. Thanks, morning. Thanks very much, JP. Um, while we're transferring the lapel mic to the next presenter, I'm going to uh, take the privilege of asking JP a question, and I'll pass you my mic. Um, JP, what did you find about the capacity contribution of price-based demand response, that is time-bearing pricing, in integrated resource planning. This is gonna require you to multitask. No, you're gonna hand you oh, my mic okay. while you're handing that mic. There we go. Yes, got it. I got this one. I'm considering this um, the motion. I like the lapel thing. Um, so question is, um, what can I say about the use of, or the treatment of uh, capacity contributions? Yeah, I, I touched a little bit on this on the presentation. Um, <clears throat> We discussed yesterday, there was at least two, one panel that went deep into resource adequacy assessments and there, you, the folks that were there were able to see the, the complexities on how we have to improve our resource adequacy assessments and, and all what you saw there applies, uh, even though it was made uh, in a general uh, sense, all of that applies to IRP. And so that gives you an idea of the types of challenges that exist to determine, to treat, if we treat price-based demand response generally as a, as a resource, we need to start thinking about the resource contributions of that resource. And, and that implies being much more transparent 
and making much more uh, much better assumptions about how price-based demand response can show up in the times of stress. It probably involves putting uh, developing 8760 representations of demand response, so essentially hourly representations of the responsiveness of customer load to certain types of rates, ho hopefully many of them, and then running those through the resource out cost assessment model to understand what the LCC of that of those different programs are and how much they eventually uh, can contribute to resource adequacy for the for the utility. And so this also implies uh, making some of these demand response sensitive to weather as the resource adequacy assessments are starting to do much more actively. In the past, they only they, they included a, a weather sensitivity for load that was very generic. But in this case, if we have specific types of price-based demand response programs, for example, that are geared towards cooling loads. Um, we know that those cooling loads are going to react differently if, it's, if there's an extremely hot day versus a, a, a temperate day. And so we have to include those type of characterizations to refine the, uh, the presentation in the RFP. Great. Thanks, JP. Um, I want to mention that um, we were hoping to have Peter Markison to represent an international viewpoint on price-based demand response. Unfortunately, he was called back uh, to Denmark. So we're going to try to get him uh, at the fall meeting. Um, and it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Jason Salmi Klotz with Portland General Electric. Oh, is it working now? Yes. Sorry about the echo this morning. Um, Jason Salmi Klotz with Portland General Electric. Um, so I'm going to talk from a utility perspective, but also as a former regulator, and take the kid out of the utility commission, but you can't take the regulator out of the kid. So um, I'll, I'll be sharing sort of two different perspectives. And as a result, I'm also going to be talking a lot about uh, the customer. So we talk about um, demand response, price-based demand response, uh, different types of uh, rate design, but we also need to think about who the customer is, how they're going to respond. And so at Portland General Electric, uh, <clears throat> We have something called the smart grid test bed, which I asked the company to create when I was with the Oregon Public Utility Commission. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and the company has been using the smart grid test bed in a bunch of different ways. They're in phase two right now. And we're going to talk about a little bit about phase one and phase two, but mostly it's to understand how to create a customer-based resource, which is demand response, price-based demand response, direct load control demand response. Um, I agree with you that demand response should be and within the integrated resource planning processes on par with other generating resources. And I agree with JP around um, capacity valuation. I thought they were a little low, the ones you found, but uh, it all comes down to valuation. It isn't just putting it into the resource planning. It's how is the utility valuing the resource. There are multiple values of demand response and DERs that do not show up in traditional resource valuation. So supply side valuation is not equal to distributed energy resource valuation. And so there are additional values that the company needs to keep in mind, stakeholders need to keep in mind, and customers need to keep in mind. So like I said, we've been exploring uh, the intricacies of uh, program participation, event participation, dynamic rates, and direct load control for about the past four years. I'm going to share a little bit about that uh, with you. So to begin with, we started the smart grid test bed back in 2019. And mostly this was to better understand the customer value proposition. Why would a customer participate? What are the values to the customer of participating in things like direct load control or price-based demand response or time variable rates? And um, we're also interested in what happens when you are communicating with those customers around their customers, these various customer value propositions in their participation of events and their participation of programs. Will they migrate from a, or will they um, stack uh, time variable rates like a peak time rebate or a TOU rate, and then also participate in a direct load control program. And what we found is that yes, they will, and when you're communicating with them and they understand the value proposition of participation, the value proposition of the rate, the value proposition of the technology, they will participate and migrate to direct load control at a faster rate than other parts of the service territory, which weren't experiencing what was happening in the smart grid test bed. So <clears throat> we wanted them to understand what demand response was 
and so we had several different uh, value propositions. The first one was just monetary incentives, right? Um, we'll give you some bill credit for participating. We are interested in whether or not this would, their participation in events would increase if they were also helping the community by giving back. Yes, they were, but they were first more interested in bill discounts. So they're willing to stack them, right? But they're first most interested in bill discounts. And third, will they increase participation if they understand what their carbon impact is? Yes, they will. All of these are customer value propositions that stack. These are values that the customer values, the community values that don't show up in integrated resource planning. They're part of the customer engagement. They're part of the customer experience. So um, you can see here a little bit about um, the percentage of respondents that are aware of the demand response concept. Baseline within PGE's service territory was actually pretty high compared to the national average, which was about 58%. But once we started moving into understanding and communicating with the customer about these value propositions, it increased a whole lot. Um, they are actually interested in understanding how to reduce their bills. And I think that's what demand response means to them and helping their communities, both local through the giving back and more broadly through the carbon reductions. And you can see here that we actually had quite a bit of migration from peak time rebate over to direct load control. Now within the smart grid test, but we had the opportunity to place customers default onto peak time rebate we had originally requested to put them on default time of use rate and our consumer advocates, citizens utility board said, no, can't do that because there are certain customers, roughly 20% of our customers cannot pay their bills. Putting them on a time of use rate by default, citizens utility board and some members of the commission felt was punitive. They didn't have the load to flex. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the, the dollars to go out and buy a thermostat or to buy a heat pump water heater or to buy a water heater that would respond to a signal. Putting them on a time of use rate wasn't gonna help them. So with peak time rebate, they could respond and see a reduction or they could not respond and not be harmed. So we put, put them opt out on a peak time rebate. And that was the basis, that was the foundation of the work that we did. And you can see that through that, they actually saw an opportunity to migrate. And we saw a lot more customers migrate over to direct load control. So we took some of those lessons from smart grid phase one, and we dropped them into smart grid phase two through the, uh, our salmon project, which is a discrete area in a red flag community in North Portland, where we're trying to reduce about 1.4 megawatts off a, a, a substation and select feeders within that service territory. We're looking through, we're sort of learning around program design how you serve these customers. These are lower income customers. How do you serve them? How do you get them onto demand response? What are the additional incentives? What's the program design? What's the outreach? How do you do that? What's the customer engagement like? Do you sit down with them? Do you have somebody in the community? Do you have a single point of contact for those people, for that community? Yes, yes, and yes. We even found that door hangers work really, really well. Instead of having people knocking on the door, just putting a door hanger on actually increased calls and interest in programs. Um, we have new participation and new partnership models for our commercial and industrial customers within the, this part of the service territory. And then we're also assessing our ADMS, our DERMs, our enterprise DERMs, and options for grid edge DERMs. Um, and then again, we're looking at DER energy and energy efficiency values. Again, there are a host of values. Um, and what the co-benefits are of co-deployment. Uh, thermostat is an energy efficiency resource. It's also a demand response resource. Believe it or not, insulation is both as well. Water heaters are both. Rooftop solar, batteries, um, electric vehicles. All these could be co-deployed with energy efficiency. So you can see here, this is a, generally our implementation approach. We are providing additional incentives in, the service in this part of the service territory to increase participation, increase uptake, and to also help those customers who normally wouldn't be able to participate. We're streamlining the installation process uh, through our work with the Energy Trust of Oregon. We're working with low income and BIPOC communities to understand what are their challenges um, and how to better serve them. Uh, many times there's additional maintenance and repair that has to be undertaken in order to install many of these measures. Um, 
There's also ongoing incentives. These are retention incentives, retention for participation. Um, and then we're also working with small, medium uh, uh, businesses as well with uh, some uh, local generation and larger energy efficiency demand response measures. This is just part of the engagement process. This is part of our customer journey. We map that out. Customer journeys go along with every demand response program that we have inside the company. Because the customer, we have to better understand how the customer is participating, how to get them to participate, how to keep them participating, and with each event, participate at the same level. So we did a little bit of modeling working with the North, uh, <coughs> with NREL, National Renewables Energy Lab, with a, um, a virtual twin of this area to better understand the actual impacts or potential impacts of the work that we're doing. Um, this is uh, some fairly technical information. Please review this and I can answer questions at a later time. Um, here are some of the co-deployment measures that we are working with in the Energy Trust. As I said, the smart, uh, the smart thermostats for everybody, additional incentives, lowering the barriers for participation, uh, for some of our BIPOC and low-income communities. Um, here are the measures, the me measure potentials. You've got HVAC, um, heat pump water heaters, uh, smart thermostats. This is the general uh, opportunity that we have within the site uh, for co-deployed measures. Um, Here's, here's the list of items that we're actually trying to better understand through co-deployment of energy efficiency demand response. And then how does that work with dynamic rate design? Dynamic rate design is also something that we're looking at with EV charging uh, within the Hillsborough service territory. We are working with electric vehicle owners and we're putting a module inside their car. And then we're changing different time of use rates to better understand which ones work best for them. How best do they respond? What are the implications on the feeders and at the substation level, each type of time of use rate for those electric vehicles. So not only are we getting load profiles for those vehicles, but we're understanding how those load profiles shift with different types of time of use rates and which types of customers like which types of time of use rates. So that when we're offering time of use rates to residential customers, we understand that there's residential customers who have garages residential customers that don't have garages. We understand that there are commercial customers that have small fleets, large fleets, industrial customers that have very big loads because they have very big vehicles. What is, happens when we put them on a time of use rate? So that's what we're learning here. Um, again, this is the customer awareness journey. What does the customer understand? How do we engage with them? How do we retain them? How do we get them to enroll? How do we get them to participate in each event? We do have a residential time of use rate. We actually have two time of use rates at Portland General Electric. Um, these are just sort of the internal talking points about what we understand why the customer likes time of use rate. It comes down to control. We have a lot of customers that want to control right, their bill Customers don't really understand rates. I, mean, I don't know if anybody's looked at their rate or their bill lately. I actually was in a meeting with our vice presidents pretty recently, and we were talking about the bill because we just increased our rates by almost 30%. And some of our vice presidents couldn't read their bill. They understood what they're paying each month, but there's a list of other items, right? on your bill that a lot of people don't understand. Customers don't understand it either. So when you engage with them on dynamic rates or time of use rates, you are gonna have to work with your customers to get them to understand what it means, what it means for them and how to arbitrage and mitigate their overall bill. And in my mind, that means there needs to be some partnership, whether that's with the utility, some sort of third party aggregator, some other entity that'll help them optimize their bill against that rate. That's something that's very difficult to put into an IRP. Um, this is just the three-tiered rate uh, for you. It's just a reference piece you can take a look at. Uh, this is the potential of number of customers within the service territory that uh, we believe would be on a time of use rate if it was highly adopted and the implications, the impacts. Okay. 
So we took all of these lessons recently and um, tried to understand what the reduction would be on the system or the, that piece of the system. If we were to stack all of these time of use rates, right? Residential peak time rates, water heating, um, residential AC, direct load control, bring your own thermostat, uh, medium commercial industrial curtailment, small, medium, uh, small commercial industrial peak time rebate, um, CNI third party for medium customers, um, small CNI water heating direct load control, um, and small CNI uh, water heating direct load control, and small CNI uh, HVAC load control. And when you start to stack them, you we started to see quite a bit of reduction on each of these feeders. So this then informs our planning processes. It also informs not only the IRP planning processes, but our distribution planning processes. So if we do have a congestion on a local line because we have either too much load or too much generation at certain hours of the day, we understand that there's an opportunity beyond putting in larger conduit, right? Or a bigger transformer that we could be working with customers through a non-wire solution or something else, or through a series of measures like this to lower the overall demand on that feeder during certain hours of the day. It's important to remember that even with any of these, these are just a few hours out of the day and customers also, this, <laughs> behind this resource is an actual customer. Customers can only respond so much, so many times. So you have to better understand how they're interacting with you, right? At the structure in which you want them to interact and what it means for them. Um, so I'm, I'm close to out of time. This is a, a map that uh, helps us but also visually understand the implications uh, of the work that we're doing. You've got right here on the top, you have uh, power flow mitigation for commercial customers before and after the mitigation measures that we just talked about, TOU plus direct load control and um, fleet and residential load control by 2024. And you can see that it could be actually quite valuable to the system. Um, so it's, it's beyond just capacity. It's an energy resource. It's also a customer resource. It's a planning resource. It's a planning risk mitigation. Um, what are we exposing ourselves to without this as far as the market? What are we exposing our customers to as far as a planning risk? If we were to not do this, we would have to purchase additional resources or we'd have to put in additional distribution infrastructure. That's a value that you wanna put into your planning regime. That's a value you want into your IRP or your distribution system planning. Utilities have yet to wholly understand what those values are, place a figure on them, quantitatively or qualitatively, it is a value that has to be considered as part of the planning process. Um, that's it, I, I'm open. Okay, thanks so much, Jason. Uh, we're gonna take questions at the end, so please write your questions down. Uh, next up, we have a tag team. We have Rob Kassman from Pacific Gas and Electric. And we have um, Mitch from Clean Valley, Mitch Sears from Clean Valley Clean Energy. And they're gonna talk about um, demand response programs for the agricultural sector. So we've talked about you know, residential and commercial, uh, but now we're really gonna look at a different kind of sector, which is really important for uh, the electricity system. Thank you. Hey, this is working, thank you. Um, Unfortunately, my voice isn't working as well as the microphone is, so I apologize for that. And um, the one thing that uh, sort of my more hoarse voice allows me to do is sing better karaoke. And I asked Lisa if I could sing my presentation, but um, she said no, absolutely. And you harmonize. Exactly. So. And so, but um, I apologize in advance. Um, I'm chewing gum. I. I normally, I can chew gum and, and uh, make a presentation at the same time. So normally I don't do this. So I apologize in advance uh, on that as well. So again, my name is Mitch Sears. I'm the executive officer for Valley Clean Energy. 
which is a community choice aggregation program located in um, Yolo County, which is just west of Sacramento. So we're nestled somewhere between, well, Sacramento and the Bay Area. And what I'm gonna do is go to my slides. Oops, wrong way. There we go. Um, <clears throat> We're, we are gonna talk about, uh, both Rob and I are gonna talk about um, a pilot in our service territory um, that really kind of gets at the question. We asked a very basic question. We said, uh, would farmers respond to hourly price signals if they were given, um, given the information to be able to respond and given sort of a, an easy user interface to be able to respond um, to those prices and given the customer support um, that was just talked about um, to be able to move them through sort of their, their journey as a customer. Um, what I wanna do though, is I wanna start with what a community choice aggregation program is because in the last couple of days talking to folks here at this conference, there's not a, a great understanding about what that is. So we are a public, we are a version of a public utility we only um, handle the generation side of the bill. Um, our partners, PG&E, handle the transmission and distribution portion of the bill, but within our service territory, we handle the generation portion of the bill. We aggregate our customer load. Uh, principally, we go out on the um, wholesale energy market and we procure to that load. Um, we are formed, and my board of directors is made up of city council members and board of supervisor members. So they're local elected officials um, that have accountability. They're running into our customers in the grocery store, um, as I do as well, because we're relatively small. Um, so what that does, and the other uh, important point here to make, I think, is that um, our customers are not captive. Um, under this system, our customers can leave and go back to PG&E um, as fully bundled customers. So we're very focused on the customer experience. We need to, the value proposition that we bring back to our customers is super important um, to us. We need to be able to be competitive with pricing, but we also need to be able to offer other um, sort of value uh, benefits in that stack to be able to keep our customers um, sort of uh, our customers. So um, in California, the, the portion on the, I guess the left-hand side of the screen here shows where all the community choice aggregation programs um, are located within the state. Um, this has been sort of a groundswell in California because there's a, a, there's a, a high interest in, in having a local voice in um, decision-making when it comes to electricity. Um, that has principally not been the case um, leading up to the formation of these CCAs. It was enabled by, um, by state uh, legislative action back in 20, I'm sorry, 2010. Um, but the oldest CCA is not only about 14 years old. We were formed about six years ago or started serving customers about six years ago. Um, but there's been this sort of real groundswell of activity in California. You can see along the coast, but overall, um, over the past 10 years or so, about 35% of California's entire load has migrated, on the generation side, migrated to one of these um, community choice aggregation programs. Um, in pg and &E service territory, over 50% of the load has migrated. It gives us an indication of how local communities want to be able to um, have a say in how local um, energy planning is done. So that's where we come in. VCE, we're relatively small. You can see here with the, the yellow arrow, um, we're there in, in Northern California. We have about 61,000 customer accounts, um, which translates to about 125,000 uh, folks, um, 700 gigawatt hour annual load and about a 225 megawatt peak. So what's happening in our particular um, uh, part of the world is that um, it gets hot, doesn't get as hot as here, um, but we're typically somewhere around during summertime, um, 100 degrees, 105 degrees is not uncommon. Um, it's a great place to grow food. It is um, indeed, um, you know, America's sort of food basket, uh, the great Central Valley of California, um, great resources. There's no better place because of the climate, the availability of water um, and the soil resources there to grow stuff. So that's our service territory. Um, about 15% of our load 
is agricultural. So when we started to think about how we can, um, how we could sort of bring value back to our customers, um, we focused on the agricultural load because for two reasons. One is that it made up a, a good portion of our load, but also it's a small margin business, um, principally. These are sophisticated business owners, but it's small margin. And so even a small amount of rate savings is something that is, um, is useful to them. Um, uh, the other thing to point out, I, I'm not sure we'll get into it, but we have a very high penetration rate of rooftop solar. About 20% of our customers are, are rooftop, are, are NEM customers. So um, what we, so we have all this agricultural load. Um, we have an interest in connecting with that customer base. Um, and so we uh, internally started thinking about, well, since we can, we have rate setting authority, um, what is it that we can do on the generation side of the bill um, that could help this uh, particular customer segment? Um, California at the same time was having heat events. Um, summer of 2020 um, was a really difficult time in California. The California Public Utilities Commission opened a proceeding um, about uh, summer reliability. And so uh, we said, well, you know, we can set rates. Um, is there a way for us to utilize the um, ability for our farmers to shift their load, which is principally bringing water up out of the ground, um, pumping load, and um, apply a dynamic pricing sort of structure around that. We didn't know what that was gonna look like, but we put that into, as a proposal into the proceeding. And ultimately we um, connected up with a, a service provider who was doing similar work. Um, and uh, they put us in touch with this LBNL study um, that showed what the, the shift potential was in California. Um, on the left-hand side here, um, you can see, and this is broken out by the amount of load that's potentially shiftable within different sectors, broken out by the, the different um, IOU service territories. So over here on the right, uh, the third column there is PGD. Um, the agricultural load shift potential was second to um, some of the office uh, shift potential. Now, why agriculture, though, becomes really important is because it's a relatively small number of customers who have large load. You're not trying to sort of pull together a bunch of office buildings um, and trying to figure out how to, um, how to get them to shift their load. So we thought, okay, we've got a lot of um, agricultural load. There's a lot of shift potential. Um, on the right-hand side, LBNL also did us a favor and looked at what sort of the the cost comparisons were between the different ways to um, shift load within those different sectors. And as it turns out, um, agricultural pumping compared very favorably to battery storage. Um, you can see it down here on the, the bottom right. Um, so it's a cost effective way to actually um, go after um, some, of the, uh, um, some of the load shift that does very interesting things for us. So, the context and opportunity of this, I don't need to go into a lot of detail here, um, but basically California does face grid reliability issues. Uh, it's very clear um, in our transition to a low and no carbon future, right? Um, water supply is also uh, a limiting resource within California. So we, we think we looked at where the co-benefits would be also with dynamic pricing. So the, the farmers, do face this convergence of threats, um, water scarcity, rapidly rising electricity costs, labor availability. These are all things that we thought that we could sort of package together in a, um, in a proposal to, um, to farmers in this particular pilot that we had, had formed up. Um, the opportunity is that the irrigation load is flat. Um, even though about half could be shifted from critical ramp hours. Um, the cost, as I talked about before, about that shift, um, incorporating automation um, is significantly less than what we would uh, typically see to deploy battery storage. We haven't done a deep dive in that. We don't have a lot of um, data to be able to show that. So we're relying on some of the work that LBNL put to sort of cross that, um, cross that Rubicon. So there is a scaling proposal. Um, that we have 
uh, identified and um, there's elements of it that I'll get into in the next slide. But basically what ended up happening, so we started running this pilot program in summer of 2022 and um, there were three basic stool, uh, legs to the stool in our uh, pilot program. One is we had to send strong price signals um, that met farmers where they're at. Um, we talked about the bill. The bill is totally inaccessible. Um, and so literally when we would go out and talk to farmers in our recruitment process, some would say, I don't even open up my bill during the irrigation season because I don't understand it and it's not actionable. There's really nothing that I can do about that. Um, that, was, that was striking for us. We also knew that automation was key in this. Um, there was a comment on the VPP presentation um, yesterday about it's a set it and forget it proposition. Um, and that's true of the farming community as well. Um, they wanna be able to understand their energy costs. They wanna be able to, to um, schedule their irrigation and they wanna be able to do that in a simple way and then go about their business of growing food. That's what their primary focus is. We realized also that the marketing, education, and outreach was critical. Um, they had to understand what the value proposition was. Um, and we came, it was clear that if we built it, they would not come without um, this uh, idea of marketing, education, and outreach. We had to demonstrate the opportunity of how they could achieve those savings. Um, and we needed close in support. On the right-hand side, you see what the results are from that initial um, season. On the top graph, the, the, the pumps that were enrolled in our, the first year of our um, pilot, um, this is with time of use um, before, so this is basically the before slide. Um, you can see it's very flat, even through the critical peak hours even with time of use. It really wasn't an effective method we were finding within the agricultural sector. After we sent, started sending them dynamic price signals, gave them the automation for the user interface to communicate directly with the pumps to make it simple for them, there was significant change um, in the load profile of these particular pumps. And you can see that basically we were able to, with these pumps, and granted it's a small sample size, um, but they were able to invert the duck curve. They were able to do exactly what we were hoping that they would be able to do um, because we were able to show them that it was a cost benefit for them um, and they were able to get the co-benefits of the automation, uh, the co-benefits associated with um, reduced labor costs and reduced labor, um, basically sending their irrigation manager from one side of the farm to the other side of the farm, just to simply turn a pump on or off. So these are things that were sort of really meaningful to this, um, to this group. How am I doing on time? Um, yep, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. But that's, that's really kind of the, the, um, the main sort of point here is that they were able, they, we answered the question that they were indeed able to respond if they were given the proper support. And I'm going to skip over this, that we did a midterm report through a third party evaluator um, that verified uh, many of these results. But I wanted to end on this slide. This is the user interface that a farmer sees. Um, farmers irrigate and plan their irrigation on a weekly basis. So in order to meet them where they're at, we had to give them not only the hourly price signals in a particular day, we needed to forecast that for the entire week. These prices are based on CAISO market-based pricing that come into the pricing machine and they get translated here. But in order to make it simple for the farmer, we gave them a green, yellow, red um, indication. This combines all the different pricing um, components, generation, transmission, distribution, um, and demand charges um, into one simple price signal that they could see and they could uh, react to. So if they needed an, a four hour irrigation block on this, uh, this Monday, the 829, they could see where it was most cost effective for them to, um, to locate that irrigation. And this is a proxy for how the grid is performing, right? These are prices that are coming straight out of CAISO. And so this is how we're able to get at the reliability issue. And this rolls up then into, um, into benefits for the overall system. 
So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and end there. There's a lot more information that I could go into, but um, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to make the presentation. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, we're gonna move on now to Rob Kassman with Pacific Gas and Electric. And Rob, I'm gonna give you your full time. So even though the clock says nine, you can have 12 and a half minutes. Okay, good morning. I am Robert Kasman from PG&E, that's Pacific Gas and Electric, not to be confused with Jason, who's from PG&E, Portland General Electric. Uh, thanks, Mitch, for that uh, handoff. So I'm gonna talk to you today about three things. Uh, the middle one being sort of lessons learned so far from this AgFit real-time pricing pilot that we're doing. I wanted to back up though, and just take a minute at the beginning uh, to present to you some research results that Pacific Gas and Electric uh, just wrapped up at the end of last year that are all about customers' responses and interest to real-time pricing and dynamic pricing. The third thing I wanna talk to you about is some new pilots that we're rolling out later this year. So I don't have a lot of time. I got three things. I'm gonna go, try to go quickly here and cover it all. I want you to get your money's worth. So very quickly, the research that PG&E wrapped up uh, late last year was all customer focused about their interest and willingness to adopt dynamic pricing, as well as other types of uh, price, price signaling rates. Uh, and it was rather comprehensive in, in terms of uh, budget, focus groups, interviews, and there, were, there was an online conjoint survey that were done with over 2,000 residential customers and almost 1,000 non-residential customers. And we had uh, six to almost 7% response rates. I've been doing research for 20 years in the utility space. And those response rates, are, they might look low, but those are actually really high response rates. Usually we get like one or 2% response rates on surveys. And so that's, um, that helps us to eliminate things like self-selection bias. So, Long story short, uh, this was pretty good research and, and uh, very thoroughly done with uh, two different consulting firms that were engaged. Um, just focusing on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, we, we talked to customers not only about the rate design, but also things like the rate peakiness uh, and the bill stability options that they might have. Uh, how important was bill protection to them? Meaning if you go on to one of these new rates and you find that you end up spending more or for the first year, you, you will be insulated from any increase. Um, also different options around price response and their sort of willingness and interest in automation equipment and then support associated with these rates. So a lot of different options. And I don't know if you're familiar with conjoint study, the way it works is we actually present a few different options to customers. You know, do you want to choose sort of menu A, menu B, or menu C? And we let them actually choose from those options. And then, you know, behind the scenes, we're shaking up how that works. And then we, we parse all that data to figure out, like, what does it all mean? Um, so just sort of, so this is a really big study. There were tons of the results. These are not all of them, but I tried to boil it down to one slide, again, because we don't have a lot of time here. Um, one key takeaway was there's a very small number of customers who are like ready and eager to jump to dynamic rates or real-time pricing. Um, this wasn't a huge surprise to us. We did see there was a, a slight increase in the number of uh, respondents who were already on TOU and were already involved in DR. They were slightly more sort of willing to go to, to full dynamic rates and yeah, it kind of makes sense because they're already doing some, um, they're either already responding to time of day in some way with TOU or they're already responding to like a peak day sort of event. Another um, key takeaway from this research was targeting was gonna be critical for dynamic rates. Uh, I 
uh, it's not looking like dynamic rates will be required of all customers, maybe not ever, but certainly not for a very long time. So these are gonna be optional rates. And so targeting sort of came out as a real a key aspect. It's not just customers have to be um, willing and able to accept dynamic rates. They've also got a load that they can shift. And so this is where targeting can play a key role. And then lastly, another key takeaway was about automation technology. And automation can sort of mean a lot of different things depending on who the customer is and, and what type of technology we're talking about automating. But um, we got a very strong response. And this came out also in a lot of um, interviews and the focus groups that while customers are interested or willing maybe to shift their load for certain times a day to be price responsive, they really don't like the idea of, of either the utility or a third party or anyone coming in and like controlling, whether it's their home or their business. Uh, they want to have control of what's happening in their business. They don't want somebody else uh, controlling their home or system or business. That was a very strong uh, feedback. Okay. So I'm gonna shift now to lessons learned from the AgFit pilot that we've been um, jointly implementing with uh, Valley Clean Energy and, and that Mitch talked about. So one of, the, one of the key lessons was, and I love what Mitch said, um, maybe that's a great summary, is if we build it, they will not come. And uh, I mean, this was one of the things that we did see is that enrollment has been um, good. We, customers have enrolled but it's been through a sort of a high touch face-to-face um, -face meetings, going out and talking to customers, explaining how the pilot works, doing bill analysis. Uh, this was done through a, a third party that Valley Clean Energy uh, engaged with. And so they've done a great job in, in enrolling the customers, but um, you know, it's, it takes time and it takes a sale. And there's a lot of th this pilot when it was rolled out, it had a two part subscription associated with the rate and customers had no idea what that was. It's very confusing to them. You know, it's a pre-purchase of energy um, uh, for the billing period before they've used it. And you know, without going into all the details, I don't know how familiar everyone is here with the subscription, but basically you're pre-purchasing energy as shown in the diagram. And then to the extent you actually use more than that pre-purchase amount, only then are you charged at the dynamic rate. And if you use less, you're credited that difference at the full dynamic rate. And so the subscription pre-purchase quantity is at the uh, your otherwise applicable tariff rate. So it insulates customers from the full dynamic rate. Um, but, but anyway, that it's, so it's actually good for customers and yet it's very confusing to them. Um, and so one of the big uh, takeaways or lessons learned was not only was the enrollment challenging, but incentives were really critical for customers to, these agricultural customers, to be willing to get automation equipment that was necessary to remote control these pumps. Because otherwise, and remote control, I'm gonna put that in, in quotes, or automate these pumps. Otherwise, you know, if you wanna shut off a pump in a, during a peak period, say from five to nine, and at 9 p.m. you wanna turn it back on, you know, someone's gotta like drive out into a dirt field down a road and go turn the pump on if you don't have the ability to, to, to remote control that. So that uh, automation equipment was, as Mitch said, one of the three legs of the stool that was really critical to, to this pilot. Um, another key uh, challenge associated with this pilot that, that emerged, or a lesson learned, I should say, is that the shadow billing was challenging. Um, let me just very quickly tell you how it works. If a customer enrolls in this dynamic rate pilot, they continue to see their regular bill, their regular bill with their regular tariff, their otherwise applicable tariff, and they continue to pay their regular bill. We send them what we call a shadow bill, which is here's what your costs would be on the dynamic rate um, so that they can see what those costs are. And then the idea is at the end of the year, if, there are, if they're spending less on the dynamic rate each month, they're, getting, they're earning credits. And at the end of the year, they, you know, we cut them a check, Valley Clean Energy cuts them a check for that uh, credit amount. One of the lessons learned though is shadow billing is not trivial. We're effectively standing up a complete independent billing system and the billing system is more complicated than our normal billing system. In our normal billing system, all we need to have is 
the tariff document and all the interval data for the customer. And with those two, you can completely calculate a customer's bill. Not the case in a dynamic rate pilot. We've got, um, without going into a lot of the details, there's multiple data sources that are coming from multiple places, including the customer's interval data. You've also got uh, all the prices that they're getting, the subscription calculation and that amount and the delta from the subscription. This pilot also has forward transactions. So customers can pre-purchase lock-in prices up to a week in advance. So all these elements make it complicated. Data is coming from multiple places. In theory, you know, we've got computers. It should be really easy to just push a button and have it all work and calculate really great. But in practice, large data sets, um, you run into challenges. And so that part has been a little bit challenging. Okay, I am keeping an eye on the clock here, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, this is really important. I mentioned earlier how the bill credits are calculated. The customers, uh, you're basically comparing their, their regular bill to what their bill would look like in the real-time pricing pilot. The, the problem is as a customer shifts their usage and they shift load, they're also impacting their regular bill, especially because most of these customers are on TOU rates. So you cannot say, well, if you know you earned a ten thousand dollar credit for the year for uh, associated with being on this pilot, that that's necessarily how much you saved relative to what would have happened had you not joined the pilot at all, because what's baked into these credits are the shifts that also happened on your your oat bill. Uh, due to the fact that you change your behavior. Now, of course, if customers uh, didn't change their behavior at all, if they just went ahead and did everything that the, like they normally would have done, then it would be a fair comparison. But that's exactly what we don't want them to do. We want them to shift load. So um, interpreting the shadow bill credit, credits can be challenging and simultaneously sort of communicating all this to customers and what does it mean if they earned a credit or not? Maybe they didn't earn a credit and the bill protection kicked in did they save? Well, maybe they did, you know, maybe they didn't. It makes it a lot harder to, to sort out that math. Um, okay, Mitch showed a slide similar to this earlier and this one has one more line on it. Um, just very quickly, the top line here is, a, this is one particular customer's usage on one pump uh, prior to doing anything. Their, their usage was pretty flat in the top line there. The orange or red line shows what their, how their usage shift when they installed automation equipment, but they were still on the TOU rate. And you can see there's a pretty sharp, sharp block where, where they were very responsive to the TOU rate. And then the third line, the green one, that's the lowest uh, one, um, that's showing automation plus dynamic rates. And the takeaway here is because the dynamic rates were apparently, uh, you know, there's more of a shoulder associate. It wasn't the, the TOU block is very crisp, you know, it's 4 to 8 p.m. or 4 to 9 p.m. Whereas there's sort of these shoulder prices that went over with the dynamic rates. And, and this shows the customer actually responded to that. And so their shift happened outside of that, that clear block in TOU. And that's great. The, the challenge here is this pilot, um, this isn't the, a perfect um, randomized control trial because what we've got is two things happen simultaneously. They got, customers got automation equipment and they're also getting dynamic prices. And so now afterwards in the evaluation where you're trying to sort out, well, what is the impact of the dynamic rate um, the reality is there's really the impact from both of those two different things going on, automation equipment and the dynamic rate simultaneously. So trying to untangle those has been a little bit challenging, um, but uh, the good news is there, there is that shift. And I am going to wrap up. This is the third and last part of the presentation. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the real-time pricing pilots that pg e is rolling out this year. There, there's three of them um, working left to right. Uh, first, we've got a vehicle to everything pilot that will launch in September of this year, and it only will run for 12 months. 
um, they got a $13 million budget and we're targeting a uh, thousand res and 250 uh, commercial service points. The middle pilot is an expansion of the existing AgFit pilot um, called our hourly flex pricing for ag agricultural customers. <clears throat> this will launch in June of this year and run through December 27. And the, it's sort of a, a twin brother to the last pilot on the right, which is essentially the same pilot for residential and non-residential customers. Um, there are some you know, differences between, between the three of these pilots, but um, they also have several similarities. And, and the similarities are they all have the subscription component, um, the dynamic pricing, it's all co complex rate. They all will be coordinating with CCAs that are in our service territory that are willing to part participate. I think pg e currently has 13 different community choice aggregators of which Valley Clean Energy is one. And so, you know, we can't force the, the CCAs to participate but if they uh, choose to uh, join and participate in these pilots with us, then we can offer that, that, those rates to these customers. Um, and of course, customers that are outside of a CCA territory, they can, um, they can participate in all of these pilots. And so I think I will, here, um, I think I will leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>